Um, what I'm going to do today is give you um, a review of aspects of the surf excavations at, uh, at Mill Hall. The trench was codenamed CB16 because there's a cottage in the corner of the field called Cranberry. You have to name it after the nearest named uh, building. And I'm also going to give you an update on the, uh, the Well Hill excavations from 2014 and 2015, um, which I told you if you were here last year in Perth, I gave a talk on those excavations. Please remember that uh, post-excavation tasks are ongoing and accordingly the presentation that follows should be understood on that basis. Uh, all observations are there for provisional working narratives. That's where we are. Uh, that's the surf area highlighted in blue, uh, located within uh, a regional map and the national map. And uh, Well Hill and uh, Mill Hall are approximately three kilometers apart. Well Hill update, the pit alignment that was excavated in 2014, which was excavated because I thought it might be Mesolithic, didn't find any Mesolithic artifacts, assumed therefore because of the material culture recovered it was early Neolithic, it's actually Mesolithic and it's very, very similar, the character is very similar to the, uh, the pit alignment at Crathers in Aberdeenshire that the Murrays excavated. Uh, other than the fact that this pit alignment is aligned north-south and the Crathers uh, pit alignment was um, aligned east-west. So not going to be a lunar calendar. And lots and lots of early Neolithic uh, dates, well not lots and lots, but a building uh, corpus of early Neolithic dates. And there's some of the dates that we've got from Well Hill. Uh, one date from Fort Teviot and one date from the putative uh, ditched enclosure at Dunnock with the INH Hill port superimposed on top. Okay, Millhall. I've been working there for a wee while, uh, doing some field walking. Uh, my colleague Kenny Brophy did a, a small excavation at Millhall Cairn and <clears throat> I decided this year to have a look at what Cadmus says as a settlement site in field MH14.4 uh, and that's uh, CB16. That's roughly the area that the trench was proposed. The trench didn't end up that shape as you'll see in a minute. And in August uh, uh, one of our technicians went out and did about 6,000 square meters of geophysics on the field going down to the main road. The data is being processed as I speak. This gives you an idea of the location of the trench. Um, as you can see behind the photographer are the Ockles and in front is the Highland Fault, a beautiful part of the world. And it's been a pleasure to work in this part of the world for the past 10 years. There's a, a, a photograph of the trench, you can see it ended up a bit funky. Um, and that was taken by Dave Cowley of uh, HES on a, on a flyby when we were uh, at the end of the excavation. And this is what we ended up with. Now, a previous uh, speaker mentioned that uh, sometimes the crop mark record doesn't, uh, it, it is, basically gone or going. But sometimes when you open up the trench, you end up with four times more than what you thought you were going to get. Um, and that's what happened here this year. And if we take away all the context numbers and we start putting together a working narrative, this is uh, more understandable. And I'll basically go through the um, the idea of grouping together features as a working narrative largely based on the material culture recovered. Uh, none of the lithics were diagnostic to a period. Uh, some of the pottery has been. I'm not a pottery specialist, I'm a lithic specialist. I'm told what the pottery is. I believe people. But I'm very pleased to say that Alison Sheridan 
where is she is coming out to have a an expert view of the property hopefully within the next month and to put together some kind of working narrative to ta to test during the post excavation uh, tasks and how, the, how these things evolve, creating an interpretation. Um, what we seem to have here are various groups of things. We have post-defined palisades. We have uh, uh, post alignments. We have a, a putative structure. We have slot-defined palisades. We've got a double kist, a very small double kist. Uh, rig and ferro, a house with a surrounding ditch. Now let's let's just go through that and put some meat on the bones. But what got me particularly excited, because my research is principally in the Mesolithic, was this what I term as a halo pit. And what brought my attention to this straight away was that in plan it was very very similar. And very similar to the uh, the Mesolithic pits at Well Hill, and unfortunately, I s we we sampled an awful lot of the, lot of this pit, and the samples have re uh, revealed nothing. So it's not going to be uh, dated by radiocarbon dating. The early Neolithic we've got a group of uh, features pits. Um, one of the pits produced a vast quantity of early Neolithic pottery. It also produced uh, uh, fragments of a, a, a saddle quern, and the saddle quern had been broken, it had been burnt, its fire cracked, and all of the pit, all of this, we have the structured de deposition of this broken saddle quern, hundreds of shirts of early Neolithic pottery, all within uh, a burnt matrix. So there's been a fire and it's all been gathered together. So this hearth matrix has been gathered, to, gathered together, deposited in the pit with the pottery and with the uh, sa saddle quern. Um, in the late Neolithic, we've got this late Neolithic um, uh, post alignment uh, with various uh, pot with pottery recovered, late Neolithic pottery recovered from various features in the post alignment. Um, so the, the pottery was covered from three of the post holes, and we also had flint and churn artifacts um, from, three, uh, from three contexts within the post holes. Again, not diagnostic, they're just uh, flakes, uh, uh, one or two blades, but you couldn't say they were diagnostic to any archaeological epoch. We have this putative structure, it's in pink there. Um, it, it's, if it is a, a structure, it's a very ephemeral structure. It's not like the wonderful timber halls that you get in the Neolithic period. But again, from the post holes to this putative structure, we're getting shirts of late Neolithic pottery. And again, we've got this non-diagnostic uh, flint debitage. Late Neolithic pits, um, <clears throat> generally uh, midden pits, but we have to be careful how we think of rubbish. Um, what we think of the rubbish is not how people were thinking of rubbish in the past, and you often find lots of wonderful things in midden pits. Uh, at Well Hill, we were finding fragments of polished stone axes and lots and lots of pottery. Uh, one of the pits um, is very interesting, is that the, uh, the pit was eventually, uh, originally dug in the early Neolithic and we're recovering early Neolithic pottery. Uh, there were two recuts at the later stage and late Neolithic pottery was recovered from the fills of both of the recuts. Uh, we move into the Bronze Age, and we've got this um, uh, all over corded uh, beaker from this uh, enclosure, uh, post-defined uh, enclosure, post-defined palisade, and we also have a double kist. And the double kist cuts through one of the slot-defined palisades, 
So we know certainly the slot to find Palisade is prior to uh, the digging of the kist. The post to find uh, uh, Palisade, um, 17 shards of pica, which compared to the amount of uh, early Neolithic pottery uh, we were recovering was not a lot, a few flint flakes, but it, it's quite interesting. It's giving us this, this idea that these, these post-defined palisades, these arcs of post-defined palisades, may well be Bronze Age. We've got, um, hopefully, the radiocarbon dating will prove us wrong or right. The double kist, oh, this was very, very badly damaged. The structure comprised of sandstone, and the problem with sandstone is it doesn't wear well with the water. Once the water gets in, its water gets in, it starts to disintegrate, and this was badly disintegrated. Um, the southern kist uh, survived in more complete form than the northern kist. There was no bone that came out. No, uh, I think one fragment of burnt bone which I don't even think our osteologists could do anything with. It really was a fragment. And this is very reminiscent to the triple kiss that we found in, uh, at Fort Teviot in 2010, uh, where there was no, no burnt bone in either of the three ki the kists, the conjoining kists there. Um, the <clears throat> There had certainly been um, a, a burning event. The, 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 what was left at the base of the kist had blanched with charcoal into this horrible gray color. Uh, and that's all there was, nothing else. No artifactual material whatsoever. And we may not have enough from the 100% sample that we took from inside of the kist to get a radiocarbon date which was also the problem that we had with the triple kist at Fort Teviot. Into the Iron Age, um, this is the, 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 a big ditch, uh, approximately uh, varying from three to four meters across, up to 1.5 meters uh, deep. And from the basal fill of the ditch, we recovered some Iron Age pottery, or what I've been told is Iron Age pottery. Um, this, you can see the ditch coming around here, then there's a terminal, then there's a ditch extension, and the ditch extension cuts one of the uh, enclosures. So in the, in the western enclosure, this is, let me just, sorry, go back. This is the Mark S1. Uh, we have a number of internal features. Um, <clears throat> we think this is an Iron Age house. We think it is contemporary with the uh, outlying ditch. Um, there are a series of uh, slots cut for planks there indicated in red and um, <clears throat> there's a center post pad and post holes in white and we think that is basically forming uh, the superstructure of the house. There are a number of other features within the house and we think that they're much later in date. Uh, this is a, a, a post-excavation sketch plan um, where you can see that what we have here is within the house. We have an area of burnt subsoil. We refer to this, this whole structure as the, the hearth complex when we were excavating it. We have a layer of occupation soil. We have paving. And we also have a cobbled surface. So it's very much looking as if it is indeed a house structure and possibly dated to the Iron Age. One feature that we I haven't yet mentioned about the, uh, uh, the house is a pit which was cut through the paving and into the subsoil 
and a cremation deposit, with a cremation deposit. Uh, we think that this could well be um, the closing deposit for uh, the end of the use of the house. Fortunately, uh, lo lots of burnt uh, bone, and we should get a date for that. These subcircular uh, palisades, what we do know is that uh, how the, the very ephemeral palisades where there's an excavation and these very ephemeral fences are kept standing with lots of subangular, subrounded stones wedged in against the base of the palisade and then uh, soil, a soil matrix packing it in. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, one of the palisades there, F2, as you can see, is cut by the ditch extension. Um, and both the palisades at F2 and F13 are similar in size, character, etc. And we believe them to be uh, contemporary. The problem with this is it's very difficult to get secure dating evidence. You may well find that you get some charcoal in the fill of this. That charcoal could have been around for a long time and through various unknown taphonomic factors ended up in that the cut of the palisade. Very difficult to get secure evidence for these features. The slot defined palisades, really quite interesting. Um, they're very, very similar to the uh, early Neolithic field boundaries that were recognized at Well Hill. And Rod McCulloch uh, recognized at Newton on Isla. The problem we have here is that, again, it's very difficult to get secure dating evidence. We are based on typology. And someone once described typologies as the lowest form of heuristic endeavor. Um, we should perhaps uh, take care about this, but it's something that we are exploring, that we are looking at um, a settlement system in a farming system in the early Neolithic at this site, uh, similar to what we've seen and recorded at Well Hill. Then we have this hearth area. Now, the hearth, the cobbling, the paved area, the burnt subsoil is identical to the internal um, features that we found in the house, where we had the post holes, we had the slots for the planks to create the superstructure. What hasn't survived are any post holes or slots to indicate that this was internal to a structure. I think it may have been, but I can't see uh, it being an outside. There's, there's too much gone into the construction of this feature for it just to be outside in a yard. Uh, that's something we've really got to try and get our heads around and look for evidence elsewhere um, and, and speak to people who know considerably more than I about uh, the Iron Age. But we should get some very good dating evidence for that. And it'll be interesting to find out if it is contemporary uh, with the house or not. That will be interesting too. Uh, structure, we've got two decommissioned post holes, something we've been finding an awful lot in our 10 years working in Strathurn. And basically what's happened here is we think these are two uh, posts related to a, a structure. Unfortunately, as always the case, if it is a structure, the other post holes are under a spoil heap. Um, but basically what happens is the post is removed and then what, what you find is that the packing stones are redeposited. It's a, a ritual decommissioning um, of a structure uh, and the structured redeposition of packing stones and often 
with uh, uh, fragments of bone or with sherds of pottery. Uh, here, we, here, in this case, in these two features, uh, fragments of bone were recovered. Uh, we had three fire pits. Um, 5.1 and 5.2 were, they don't look at there, but they were basically rectangular cuts. Now, fire pits can date anywhere from the Mesolithic onwards and through into the Iron Age. The evidence in Scotland for each archaeological, archaeological epoch for, for fire pits. One of the things I really couldn't come to terms with, with these two fire pits, is that the subsoil was not burnt. Now, what can we infer from that? Well, first of all, is it may not be a burning event. It may be a rectangular, a sub-rectangular pit that was dug and the remains of a fire pit were then redeposited in these pits. Conversely, we know from ethnographic evidence that many indigenous peoples uh, constructing fire pits would lay the fire pits at the base of the fire pits with plant materials. And then the fire pit would be constructed on top of the plant materials. The plant materials generally uh, damp would protect the subsoil from burning. Now, there's no evidence, we didn't recover any evidence of uh, plant materials at the base uh, of these fire pits. Again, if it's protecting, uh, if it's protecting the subsoil, uh, it would be burned. Uh, we'll get some charcoal. It's something that we're playing around with deciding whether it is a redeposition re of fire pit material from elsewhere. It's very close to a stream. It's where you expect fire pits to be. Um, or whether indeed they are fire pits in situ. 5.3 is different. We perhaps, uh, um, it's, it's located near uh, the other two fire pits. But this is a simple shallow bow-shaped pit um, into sand. And what we can't tell is, is whether or not this is, we, we think this may be burning in situ. Um, and of course, the problem with sand is it's, it's so much more difficult to ascertain whether you've got burnt sand uh, below the, the fill of the pit as opposed to a soil matrix, which is very clearly can be seen with the oxidization. So, what we've got is, what we think we've got is the material culture we covered suggests the palimpsest of early Neolithic, late Neolithic, Bronze Age, and Iron Age settlement events. We've got the KISS, but the KISS is the only really non-settlement evidence. Um, it was, it, it was a, a very difficult site to dig. Um, the students and the volunteers, of which there were many, um, did an absolutely wonderful job. And the records alone, those 2,000 records that had to be digitized, it was a, it was a huge undertaking. Um, it's provided an awful lot of information for settlement people living uh, in the Dunning area. We've now got time depth in Dunning of 10,000 years uh, in this area. Uh, and the idea now is to tell that story. And this really is the denouement of uh, the SURF project. I'm hoping to do a small excavation in March, April, which will be the final, final excavation also at Mill Hall but that will be um, a very small concern. It certainly won't be 2,300 square meters uh, jam-packed with archaeology. So what we've got to do now is, um, is bring this all to publication. And basically that's what we're working on now. Um, all of the uh, 
samples taken from the features at CB16 have now been processed and they will be heading off to the archaeobotanist on Monday. Once we get the IDs back from uh, Dr. Susan Ramsey, we will then be able to go for the uh, radiocarbon data. Uh, we're not going to get that in the current round of the 31st uh, March 2017. Uh, we'll not get the stuff back from Susan before then. Um, so it's probably going to be in the year to 31st March 2018 by the time we get the radiocarbon dates. But in publication, we've got two, the first two monographs should be with the publishers um, by summer next year. And the plan is for the remaining three monographs to be with the publisher um, by early 2019. So there's going to be this huge five volume set of monographs uh, for the SURF project. Um, having been involved with the SURF project from the uh, outset, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. We could dig in Strathurn for 30 years, for 40 years, well somebody else could, I wouldn't be alive. But, but you, you could continue this on. But um, th th there comes a natural end. You've got your research questions. You're answering your research questions. You've got this wonderful amount of da data. You've got this layers of information. It's naturally reached its conclusion. It's time to stop. It's time to concentrate on getting all the information we have out to you, the public, because after all, it's your archaeology. It's your area. And that's what our concentration uh, is on now. But hundreds of people, hundreds of archaeologists have been trained, hundreds of uh, volunteers over the years who have given their time freely. There's a couple in the audience here today. Um, wonderful people, met, met, met so many people over these 10 years from all around the world, from China, from Japan, from Australia, from South America, from Canada, the USA, students, international students who've come, engaged and participated and paid an awful lot of money to be involved in the SURF project. And it's something we're working on now is to create an alumni of everybody who was involved in the SURF project, whether you're a Glasgow student, uh, an international student or indeed a volunteer. Because what we'd like to do now is find out what everybody's doing, where their lives have been going, etc. So that's for uh, the future. Thank you very much.